I'd like to cover one more simulation technique this week, and that is setting the velocities for an object based on a reference point, or more specifically, to have a reference point and all of the velocities pointing away from that point as if it was an explosion or something. So to demonstrate this, I've used our activation demo where we hard-coded the, the left, right, and center sections to go off at a specific frame with random offsets. And the only change I've made to that is I've deleted the initial velocities from the attribute wrangle nodes because we're going to be specifying those velocities with a little bit of calculation. Now here I've added a primitive sphere to our scene and I'm going to add an attribute wrangle node where we'll calculate our velocity. So let's call this attribute wrangle velocity calc. And we'll drop that in. Um, let's put it before our attribute wrangle pre-sim. Now on this velocity calc attribute wrangle, we'll connect the sphere to the second input and we will create a vector attribute called velocity and we'll set that equal to the position of the sphere just for the sake of testing. So we used a similar point function call in our proximity activation demo. So we'll say point one for the second input since the inputs are started uh, numbering at zero and we'll look up p for the position and at this instead of pt num we'll say zero for point number zero since this primitive sphere only has one point on it at its center. Now if we look at the spreadsheet for this attribute wrangle you'll see that this uh, this velocity attribute is set to the same as the sphere's position. It's eight units in X by 3163 by minus 190. So we don't want to use the position as the actual velocity. We're just at this point um, making sure that we're accessing that position properly. And we can compare the position of the current piece that we're processing to the position of the sphere to create a velocity vector between them. To compute that velocity vector, we can take the current position of the current piece, which is just that at p for the p attribute, and then subtract the point position of the sphere. That'll give you a vector from the sphere's position to the current piece. Now, if we display our dotnet, and if we play through that, we should see our pieces shooting away from the sphere. And actually, this could be interesting. I didn't mean for the sphere to be animated. I copied this from the proximity activation scene and forgot to turn off its animation, but it's actually kind of cool because you can see how when the initial pieces were activated, they started firing away from the sphere. And as the sphere moved over here, these other pieces started shooting off in the opposite direction. So although I had meant for the reference point to be static, this is actually a pretty sweet test case and I'm glad we encountered that. So for now, I'm going to copy this sphere. We'll keep the animated one in case we want to try that again. And for this sphere, I'm going to just make it static. Control, Shift, Click, that center parameter so it's not moving or anything. And now if we move this object to the other side of our geometry, now if we play our simulation with the sphere moved, then we should see all of our pieces shoot off in a different direction away from the new sphere's position. Now you'll see like some of these pieces 
are kind of bouncing this way a bit, that's because we're just giving an initial velocity, and these pieces probably just collided with some of the others, which made them bounce uh, the other way after their initial velocity. So there are a lot of collisions affecting our results, but you can see generally that all of these pieces are trying to shoot away from this sphere's position. Now because we're just doing a very basic calculation, subtracting this position from the piece position, that means the vector that the far away pieces receive is much larger than the vector that the close up ones receive. And that's not very realistic. If anything, you would want the opposite. Where if, let's say this was an explosion, you'd want the close up pieces to behave much more strongly than the far away ones. So in order to ensure that all of the pieces get the same strength of velocity, just with the direction depending on the position, we can normalize the velocity attribute. So if we go back to our attribute wrangle, we have a convenient function called normalize, and that will convert the strength of the velocity to a unit vector. So if the general magnitude, let's say the vector is 100 units long, it will make it point in the same direction, but only one unit. And that's always a good starting point, even if you want a varied velocity between all the pieces, it's good to start with a normalized vector and then we can add in, you know, extra velocity strength based on whatever conditions you may desire. So now, um, I'm not sure how obvious this effect will be, but if we play the simulation again, you should see that all of the pieces get a much smaller effect. First of all, I guess that's not very subtle. Um, we're going to need a lot more strength than this in order to see the effects. I actually quite like how this is looking though. It's a pretty cool crumbling effect we're getting right there. But that's not what we're looking for right now. So I'm going to multiply the velocity vector up a little bit. Actually, I should say I'll multiply it up quite a lot. So we'll say v at v times equals 100. So that will make the velocity 100 times stronger than it currently is. Now if we rewind this and hit play, we should see much, much stronger effects from that initial velocity. Now this is having a hard time shooting in that direction because these pieces are colliding with other pieces that are static and not moving yet, but you should be able to tell that the overall amount of velocity is about the same between the far pieces and the close pieces. So this is a really good way to get pieces moving in a direction that you'd like. Um, I've worked on shots where there are, let's say there are multiple explosions happening in a road, so I will put in multiple placeholder spots that will be my explosion reference points, and then the, you calculate the velocity based on each one of those plotted explosion points, and it's a really nice way to get things emanating out in a burst fashion. Now I'd like to show one more example of how you can tweak these initial velocities a bit. And so, just so you can see the velocity more clearly without it being affected by collisions, I've enabled the collision ignore attribute to be overwritten on this RBD packed object here. And then on this attribute wrangle presim, I've created a string attribute s at collision ignore is equal to an asterisk. That means it will ignore everything. If you were to use an empty string, just two quotation marks, that would mean it ignores nothing, essentially enabling all collisions. So we've got collisions disabled there, and I've turned off 
my velocity multiplier of 100 and I've swapped in a fit function instead. So I'm multiplying the velocity by a number between 100 and 5. So we've talked about the fit01 function a little bit, but this regular fit function is useful for modifying our velocities based on attributes that don't fall into that 0 to 1 range. So um, in order to more easily access the, vo the volume in a point wrangle, um, I've promoted that from a primitive attribute to a point attribute, and I've called it PT volume for point volume, and I've told it to not delete the original. So in our velocity calculation, uh, we can use that point volume, which if you look at the spreadsheet and we sort by that point volume column, you'll see this ranges from really huge chunks, around 53,000 units in volume, down to super tiny, less than one unit. And you'll see that these larger values, they seem like um, they increase gradually and steadily up to around a thousand where you just have a few pieces that take off much higher after that. So what I'm doing is I'm telling it to remap all the pieces from ze between zero and a thousand units of volume. And the way the fit function works is the first parameter is the volume that you're doing the remap on and the second parameter is the input minimum, the third is the input maximum, so we'll say they range from 0 to 1000, and then this says we want anything with a volume of 0 to return a 100 from this fit function, or if it has a volume of 1000 it would return 5, and then it linearly interpolates between there. So if for example, something had a volume of 500, it would probably get about somewhere around 50 being returned from this fit function. And if anything is outside that 0 to 1000 range, it'll just get clamped to these min and max values of 100 and 5. And then to illustrate how we can also use multipliers on individual components of the vector, just the x, y, or z, I've multiplied the y value of the vector by 6 just to get more upwards force instead of an even radial force. So now if we play this, you'll see that the large pieces are getting much, much less velocity for their initial velocity since they're being, they have a multiplier down in the range of 5 whereas the smaller pieces, the smallest of them, get a multiplier closer to 100. So these sorts of things are really handy to give different behaviors to different size pieces, or like I mentioned earlier, you could use a fit function to create a multiplier that depends on the distance between the objects, or basically any sort of relationship that you can think of, you can you know, you can manipulate in this way.